Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to continue uh, looking at the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We are actually going to take a couple steps back from last week. <clears throat> so tonight we're going to do Sutta, excuse me, Sutta number 22. So last week we did Sutta number 24 in the same collection. So we're taking two steps back to do the Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake. So you may recall if you were here last week that we moved into a new section of the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. And so we're in the, um, I guess the third collection of 10 suttas. And this is the collection that are all based on similes. So I introduced this last week. It was the, the simile of the deer catcher. <clears throat> that was sutta number 24. And I was going to do this sutta last week, but I wanted us to kind of just ease into the, the simile section. But now let's get to this one. So sutta number 22 is perhaps the most popular of this little group. This, is, this sutta contains the famous parable of the raft. And I want to mention just a couple of things before I do a reading of the sutta. So I've taught this sutta, or at least I've taught parts of this sutta a number of times because of the famous parable of the raft. But actually tonight, I'm looking forward to sharing the whole sutta with you. It's a very interesting sutta. And the parable of the raft is really just one small piece of it in that way. So I'm not going to spend too much time getting us ready because there's really not much to say. It's one of those sutta that's, suttas that speaks for itself. Let me just kind of give you the, the quick background story. So this sutta is pretty kind of famous for this monk named Arittaha. Arittaha, he gets kicked out. He gets kicked out of the Sangha. And he gets kicked out of the Sangha because of what happens in this sutta. Now, this story of this monk is found in other places in the Buddhist canon. So we, we don't get the full backstory here. But when you find out the whole story, he, again, eventually winds up getting kicked out. Why does he get kicked out? Well, he gets kicked out because he has or he holds a wrong view. And we're going to be introduced to it right away, but I just kind of want you to understand what's at stake or like what, you know, what's going on with this monk. Right away, we are going to be introduced to the idea that this monk, Arittaha, He's going around telling everybody that things that have been called obstructions by the Buddha, that they don't actually, they're not actually able to obstruct anybody who engages in them. In other words, this monk's walking around saying that the obstructions that the Buddha's always talking about, oh yeah, they're they're no problem. They're, they're, they're actually not obstructions. And r right away, this monk is going to be confronted by some other monks like, hey, that's not what the Buddha teaches. And then the whole thing will become a kind of grand teaching about what it is that the Buddha does teach. And so this monk is holding, and, and I, I'll give you another quick little like, recap or or you know preview basically it's about sensual pleasures and the monk aritaha doesn't think there's any problem with sensual pleasures now the bigger problem 
is that he's actually seemingly going around and telling people, oh yeah, we Buddhists? Oh yeah, we don't see any problem with sensual pleasures. <laughs> well, that's not the Dharma at all, exactly. And so there's sort of two problems. One, that this monk holds that view, but the bigger problem is that he's going around telling people that this is what the Buddha teaches. And that's where things need to kind of be corrected because it's not what the Buddha teaches. So we're going to find out all about that. It's really just going to be about this idea of obstructions, primarily about sensual pleasures, and then not being attracted to sensual pleasures in that way. The only other thing I want to mention, because it's going to come up, I couldn't find a lot of background on this monk besides his famous uh, expulsion, but he is going to be referenced as being formally of the vulture killers. And there's a lot of uh, uh, footnotes, a lot of uh, comment on what it means to be a vulture killer most other translators don't translate it as a vulture killer, but a vulture trapper and trainer. Maybe that involves killing them at some point, but it sounds more like he was basically a vulture trapper. We don't really know what that means, though, but I'm just going to stick to the language as it's found in our version. So we just need to know he had this background or a past <laughs> of training or catching vultures, trapping them in that way. Other than that, again, it's a very interesting sutta. Um, it's a little long, so allow me to dive in here. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to get through the whole thing, but, and there you go. The link is in the chat and here we go. Alugadupama Sutta, the Majjhima Nikaya number 22 the simile of the snake. Thus, <clears throat> thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Arittaha, formerly of the vulture killers. And the view arose thus. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Several bhikkhus, having heard about this, went to the bhikkhu Arittaha and asked him, Friend Arittaha, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Then these bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Aritaha! Do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It's not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak of us. For in many ways, the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of a skeleton, with the simile of a piece of meat, with the simile of a grass torch being held against the wind, with a simile of a pit of fiery coals, with the simile of things seen in a dream, with the simile of borrowed goods, with the simile of fruits on a tree, with the simile of the butcher's knife and butcher's block, with the simile of the sword stake, 
And with the simile of the snake's head, the Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by those bhikkhus in this way, the bhikkhu aritaha, formerly of the vulture killers, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Since the bhikkhus were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down to one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the Bhikkhu Aritaha, formerly of the vulture killers, from this pernicious view, we have reported the matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a, buk a certain Bhikkhu thus, Come, Bhikkhu. Tell the Bhikkhu Aritaha, formerly of the vulture killers, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to the Bhikkhu Aritaha and told him, the teacher calls you, friend Aritaha. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Aritaha. Is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? That, as I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them? Exactly so, Venerable Sir. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. <gasps> Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me teach the Dharma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of a piece of meat, with the simile of a grass torch, with the simile of a pit of coals, the simile of a dream, with the simile of borrowed goods, with the simile of fruits on a tree, with the simile of the butcher's knife and butcher's block, with the simile of the sword stake, and with the simile of the snake's head. I have stated, <clears throat> that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. But you, misguided man, by your wrong grasp, have misrepresented us, injured yourself, and stored up much demerit. <clears throat> for this you will, will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Has the bhikkhu Aritaha, formerly of the vulture killers, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this dharma and this discipline? How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the bhikkhu Aritaha, formerly of the vulture's killer, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, with no response. Then, knowing this, the Buddha, the Blessed One, told him, Misguided man, you will be recognized by your pernicious view. I shall question the bhikkhus on this matter. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, do you understand the Dharma taught by me as this Bhikkhu Aritaha, formerly of the vulture killers, does when by his wrong grasp he misrepresents us, injures himself, and stores up much demerit? No, venerable sir, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions 
and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of a skeleton, the simile of a snake's head, the Blessed One has stated that the danger in sensual pleasures is still more. Good bhikkhus, it's good that you understand the Dharma taught by me thus. For in many ways I've stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they're able to obstruct one who engages in them. I've stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of a skeleton, the simile of a snake's head, and others, I've stated how the danger in these things is still more. But this bhikkhu, Aritaha, formerly of the vulture's killer, vulture killers, by his wrong grasp, misrepresents us, injures himself, and stores up much demerit. For this will lead to this misguided man's harm and suffering for a long time. Bhikkhus, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual pleasures, without perceptions of sensual pleasures, without thoughts of sensual pleasures, that's impossible. Here, Bhikkhus, let me give you an example. Some misguided people hear the Dharma, learn the Dharma, learn discourses and stanzas and expositions and verses and exclamations and sayings, birth stories, marvels, and the various answers to questions. But having learned all that dharma, they do not examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Not examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. Instead, they learn the Dharma only for the sake of criticizing others and for the wake and for the sake of winning debates. And they don't experience the good for the sake of which they learn the Dharma in the first place. Those teachings being wrongly grasped con are conducive to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? because of the wrong grasp of the teachings. Suppose someone needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and grasped its coils or its tail. It would turn back on them and bite their hand or bite their arm or some other limb. And because of that, they would come to death or deadly suffering. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasping of the snake. So too, here some misguided people learn the Dharma, but only for the sake of being able to criticize others and win debates. And because of that, that is a wrong grasping of the teachings. But here, bhikkhus, some members of the Sangha learn the Dharma, learn all the discourses and stanzas and sayings and answers to questions and so on. And having learned the Dharma, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Examining the meaning of those teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dharma just for the sake of criticizing others or for winning debates. And they experience the good for the sake of which they learned the Dharma in the first place. Those teachings, being correctly, rightly grasped, are conducive to their welfare and happiness for a long time. And why is that? Because of the right grasping of the teachings. Suppose someone needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake, and they caught it rightly with a cleft stick, and having done so, grasped it rightly by the neck. Then, 
Although the snake might wrap around its coils around his hand or their arms or their limbs, still they would not come to death or deadly suffering because of that. And why is that? Because of their right grasp of the snake. And so too, here some member of the Sangha learns the Dharma, but not for the sake of just criticizing others. And they have a right grasp of the Dharma. Therefore, bhikkhus, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statements, then ask either me about it or those bhikkhus who are wise. Bhikkhus, I shall show you how the Dharma is like a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. And the, the bhikkhus replied, and the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, suppose someone in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from fear, but there was no ferry boat or, and there was no bridge for going over to the far shore. Then they thought, there is this great expanse of water whose near shore is dangerous and fearful and whose further shore is safe and free from fear, but there's no ferry bo boat or bridge for going to the far shore. Suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bind them together into a raft and supported by the raft and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. And then the person collected grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bound them together into a raft and supported by the raft and making an effort with their hands and feet. They got across safely to the, other, to the far shore. Then, when they had gotten across and had arrived at the far shore, they might think thus. This raft has been very helpful to me. Since, supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it onto my head or load it onto my shoulders. Then I could go wherever I want. Now, bhikkhus, what do you think? By doing so, would that person be doing what should be done with the raft? No, venerable sir. By doing what would that person be doing what should be done with the raft? Here, bhikkhus, when that person got across and had arrived at the far shore, they might think thus. This raft has been very helpful to me since, supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to haul it onto dry land or set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I want. Now, bhikkhus, it is by doing so that they would be doing what should be done with the raft. So I have shown you how the Dharma I teach is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Bhikkhus, when you know the Dharma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings, how much more so those things that are contrary to the teachings. Bhikkhus, there are six standpoints for drishtis, for views. What are those six? Here, Bhikkhus, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who has no regard for true people and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, they regard material physical form. Thus, 
This is mine. This I am. This is myself. They regard sensations thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. They regard perceptions thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. They regard conditioned habitual formations thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. They regard what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, and mentally produced thus. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. And this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world, and thinking after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too they regard thus, meaning that view of the world as me. This is mine. This I am. This is myself. Bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for true people and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, they regard material physical form thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. They regard sensations thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. They regard perception thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. They regard conditioned habitual habits thus. These are not mine. These I am not. These are not myself. They regard what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, and mentally pondered thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world. And after death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This too, the noble disciple regards thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Since they regard them thus, the noble disciple is not agitated about what is non-existent. When this was said, a certain bhikkhu asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, can there be agitation about what is not existent externally? There can be bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. I'll show you. Here, Bhikkhu, someone thinks thus. Ah, oh, alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it in the future. Alas, I don't get it. Then they sorrow, grieve, and lament. They weep, beating their chest, and become distraught. That's how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable Sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be Bhikkhu, <clears throat> the Blessed One said. <clears throat> Here, Bhikkhu, someone does not think thus. They don't think. Oh, I had it. Oh, I don't have it any longer. Oh, may I please have it in the future? 
Oh, I didn't get it. Then they don't sorrow. They don't grieve. They don't lament. They don't weep. They don't beat their chest and become distraught. That's how there's no agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be bhikkhus, the Blessed One said. Here, bhikkhus, someone has the view, that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. That person who thinks that way, they hear the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, teaching the Dharma for the elimination of all standpoints, the elimination of all decisions, the elimination of all obsessions, adherences, and all underlying tendencies. They hear about the stilling of all habitual karmic behaviors. They hear about the relinquishing of all attachments, about the destruction of all craving, about dispassion, cessation. They hear about nirvana. And they think thus, Oh, I'll be annihilated. I'll perish. I shall be no more. Then they sorrow and grieve and lament and they weep and they beat their chest and become distraught. That's how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. But venerable sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent internally? There can be, Bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. Here, Bhikkhu, someone does not have the view that which is the self is the world. I shall endure as long as eternity. When they hear the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dharma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all habitual karma, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for nirvana, when they hear that, they don't think thus. Huh? So I shall be annihilated? So I shall perish? So, so I shall be no more? Then they don't sorrow. They don't grieve. They don't lament. They don't weep. They don't beat their chest. They don't become distraught. That's how there's no agitation about what is non-existent internally. Bhikkhus, you may well acquire that possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Yeah, that, that might happen, but do you see any such possession in this world, Bhikkhus? that could be eternal and last forever? No, venerable sir. Good bhikkhus, because I too do not see any possession in this world that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Bhikkhus, you may very well cling to the teaching of a self that would not arouse sorrow or lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to that self. But, but bhikkhus, do you see any such teaching or any such doctrine of a self that doesn't lead to sorrow? No, venerable sir. 
good bhikkhus, because I too do not see any teaching, any doctrine of a self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings it to it. Bhikkhus, you may well take as a support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. But bhikkhus, do you see any such support for views? No, venerable sir. Good bhikkhus, because I too do not see any support of views that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. Bhikkhus, there being a self, would there be for me what belongs to a self? Meaning mine? Yes, venerable sir. Or there being what belongs to a self, meaning like mine, would then there be for me a self? Yes, venerable sir. That's, that's how it works. Well, bhikkhus, since a self and what belongs to a self are not actually apprehended as true and established, then that standpoint for views Namely, that which is the self is the world, and after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? What else could it be, venerable sir, but an utterly and completely foolish teaching? Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is physical material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. And is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering? and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself? No, venerable sir. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Is sensation and perceptions and conditioned habits and consciousness, are all of those things permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness. Suffering, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded as mine, as what I am, and as myself? No, venerable sir. Therefore, because any kind of material form whatsoever, whether in the past, in the future, or present, whether internal or external, whether gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This is not what I am. This is not myself. Any kind of sensations whatsoever, perceptions whatsoever, conditioned habits whatsoever, and any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether in the past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. All sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This is not me. This is not myself. 
Seeing thus, bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with sensations, disenchanted with perceptions, dis disenchanted with habits, disenchanted with consciousness. Being disenchanted, they become dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. And one understands. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There's no more coming to any state of being. Bhikkhus. This bhikkhu is called one whose crossbar has been lifted, who's, one whose trench has been filled in, one whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bolt or lock, a noble one whose banner has been lowered, whose burden has been lowered, one who is unfettered. And how is the bhikkhu one whose crossbar has been lifted? Here the bhikkhu has abandoned ignorance, has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That's how the bhikkhu is one whose crossbar has been lifted off. And how is the bhikkhu one whose trench has been filled in? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned the round of births that brings new, renewed being, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That's how the bhikkhu is one whose trench has been filled in. And how is the bhikkhu one whose pillar has been uprooted? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned craving, has cut it off at the root so that it no longer is subject to future arising. That's how a bhikkhu is one whose pillar has been uprooted. And how is the bhikkhu one who has no bolt? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned the five lower fetters, has cut them off at the root so that they no longer are subject to future arising. That's how the bhikkhu is one who has no bolt. And how is the bhikkhu a noble one whose banner has been lowered, whose burden has been lowered, who is unfettered? Here a bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit, I am, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That's how the bhikkhu is a, a, bhikkhu is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden has been lowered, who is unfettered. Bhikkhus. When the gods, along with Indra, Brahma, and Pajapati, when they seek a bhikkhu who is thus liberated in mind, they don't find anything of which they could say, the consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. And why is that? Why couldn't the gods say what their mind is based on? Because one thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. So saying, bhikkhus, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. They say, the recluse Gotama is one who leads people astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, and the extermination of an existing being. As I am not, as I do not proclaim, so have I been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus, they're going around saying that the recluse Gotama is one who leads people astray, 
who teaches the annihilation, destruction, and extermination of an existing being. Bhikkhus, both formerly, back in the day, and now, what I teach is suffering and the cessation of suffering. If others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no annoyance, no bitterness, no de dejection of the heart. And likewise, if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata, for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no delight, no joy, no elation of the heart. If others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account thinks thus, they perform such services as these for me in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. Therefore, bhikkhus, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass you, on that account, you should not entertain any annoyance, bitterness, or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you, on that account, you should not entertain any delight, joy, or elation of heart. If others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you, on that account, you should think thus. They perform such services as these for us in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. Therefore, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a very long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Sensations are not yours. Abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Habits, conditioned behaviors, are not yours. Abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Consciousness is not yours. <laughs> abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. I mean, bhikkhus, what do you think? What do you think? If people went around and carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves that are here in this Jetta's grove and burned them or did whatever they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off or they're burning us or they're doing with us what they like? No, venerable sir. Why not? Because that, the grass, the sticks, and so on, because that is neither ourself nor what belongs to ourself. So too, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that's not yours? Form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the five aggregates, are not yours. Abandon them. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, wide open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, there is no future round for manifestation in the case of those bhikkhus who are arahats, 
with their taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down their burden, reached their own goal, goal destroyed the fetters of being, and who are completely liberated through final knowledge. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. In the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have, ab who have abandoned the five lower fetters are all due to reappear spontaneously in the pure heavenly abodes, and there they will attain nirvana without ever returning, being non-returners to this world. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, is free, is clear and free of patchwork. In the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters and attenuated their desire, hatred, and delusion, they are all once returners, returning once more to this world to make an end to suffering. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork, and in the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, and headed ultimately for enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork, and in the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who are Dharma followers or faith followers are all ultimately headed for enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. And in the Dharma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, those who have sufficient faith in me, sufficient love for me, they're all headed for heaven. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right, let's jump back to the beginning. So anything jump out at anybody from the start? Any just immediate kind of comments or ideas, questions, anything? Oh, cool. well, let's start going through it. And if, you know, things come up, just let me know. So we have our, our problem with Aritaha, our, the problem with our monk formerly of the vulture killers, who just basically seems <laughs> that was a lot, Noam. And, but actually, I'll, I'll address Noam's comment about that being a lot. It is a lot. And I was thinking... I knew it would be a lot, like I, I knew it would be a long reading. And so I, I kind of was like, well, maybe there's like some parts I could like drop, but every part seemed significant to me in terms of getting all the way through it in that way. And so at a certain point I decided, you know, we just kind of have to do the whole thing in that way. So, but I do agree know that there was a kind of a lot of things, but even though there's a lot, I feel like there's a very clear through line. And let me let me kind of just spell out what I what I see as that through line. So that through line, of course, it really does come down to the parable of the raft. And what I mean is is that the parable of the of the raft, which is just that tiny little section, you know, it's basically just one page of this. But the parable of, of the raft is that really, really important teaching. 
And it's the idea that all of these teachings, all of these sutras, all of these ideas, they're all a means. They're a means for alleviating suffering, quote, getting to the other shore. But the idea here is, is, and it's it's really interesting. It's in the 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 way the parable is, where the person who you know, isn't doing it the right way. They make a raft, they get to the other shore and they attribute their success to the raft. And there's that idea of like, oh, well then I should pick up this raft and carry it on my head or carry it on my shoulders so that I could go wherever I want. But that person isn't thinking clearly. The raft is not what allows them to go wherever they want. But the first person is mis it misunderstands the role of the raft and so wants to continue to grasp or hold on to the raft. Whereas the wise person is like, this, this raft has been great. This raft is what helped me get to the other shore. But I'm in the I'm on the other shore now. I could I'm done with the raft. And notice that the language is and without the raft I could go wherever I want. So the uh, the first person thinks that their freedom or their liberty to go anywhere is because of the raft and so they need to keep taking it with them. And that's the misunderstanding. And so the Buddha at the very end, it's that the very famous line, which is that you should abandon these teachings. You should ultimately abandon the Dharma. How much more so what somebody like Arittaha is teaching? So there is a through line and the through line is about, I would say that the through line of this sutra, it's about the tricky nature of the Dharma. It's about the tricky nature of Buddhist teachings. And it's this really, really subtle idea that is ultimately, by the way, revolving around the teaching of no self, of course. That's what most of the Dharma taught in this sutra, is the teaching of no self. But then the, the story is this sort of story about getting attached to the teachings and then missing something. And this is the, ultimately, if you didn't catch it, by the way, let me, let me mention it. This sutta is called the, the simile of the snake. And if you didn't catch it, because there were a lot of similes in there, the snake is the one about the person grabbing the snake the wrong way and getting bit versus grabbing the snake the right way and not getting bit. And the, of course, the Buddha is talking about the Dharma, like the teachings. And there's one way to grab the teachings. And it's the way that ultimately the Buddha winds up talking at the end it's where people are going around saying that the Buddha teaches the destruction of the self, teaches the elimination of the self. And the Buddha's like, that is not what I'm teaching. If somebody has picked up my teachings and what they're taking from it is the destruction or the elimination of the self, They've grabbed my teachings the wrong way, and it's biting them in that sense. And just a quick reminder, the reason why that's a misrepresentation of Buddha Dharma, the reason why that's a misrepresentation of what the Buddha is teaching, the Buddha doesn't teach the destruction or the elimination of the self. He teaches that there isn't a self. It is already the case that there is not. So there is nothing to be destroyed. 
There's nothing to eliminate. There is a, a persistent delusion of a self that needs to be dealt with. But there is no actual self that is destroyed. And that's a misunderstanding of Buddhism. And there was that funny part of where the people who misunderstand the, the Dharma, they go, oh, you mean I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out of existence? <clears throat> I don't want to practice Buddhism then. I don't want to go out of existence then. <laughs> but notice the subtlety of the teaching there. It's a very kind of snake-like teaching in terms of it's very slippery in that way. No. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was really struck at the very end of the parable of the raft. He says, it says, uh, so I've shown you how the Dharma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. And it's really, I don't even know how to say it. It's hard to even express, but just something about, like if anything you grasp onto, even the thing that helped you cross the river is just grasping when you no longer need it. Mm -hmm. Or even when you're on the raft crossing the river, you shouldn't be grasping. <laughs> really, yeah. Mm -hmm. so just that it struck me very uh, strongly, uh, and because it's like, uh, I mean, I've known about the parable of the raft for so long, and yeah, you know, when you're when you when you've crossed the other side and you no longer need the raft, but just the idea that thinking you need the raft is a form of grasping. Mm -hmm not a form of like keeping around things that might be helpful in the future, you know, that was really powerful. Yeah. This is not dissuading that, you know, a type of uh, wisdom or su sagacity that would, yeah, that it's not about that. Absolutely. Um, by the way, Noam, on, the, on note, on the note of that line, um, that the Dharma is for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. That's also, I want to kind of remind you of what that is also sort of alluding to. That is also alluding to what the Buddha was talking about, where he was saying that uh, basically in the section on the simile of the snake, where he's talking about the people who get it wrong, he says they learn the Dharma only for the sake of criticizing others for and for winning debates. And they actually don't experience the good of the Dharma. That's grasping at the Dharma as like, you know, an intellectual prize, right? Where it's like, ah, like I've studied all this Dharma and now I know it and I could win debates and I could criticize others for getting the Dharma wrong which is a like that's that's always a kind of really wild tricky thing is especially I, i'm very guilty of it all the time it's a it's a practice of mine to to be very aware of basically upaya frankly to be very aware that when somebody is teaching to a group that's what needs to happen. And any kind of coming in from the outside and be like, you're doing it wrong. That's not what emptiness means. That's not really the teaching of no self. I've had to cultivate a practice of not doing that. And what I was doing and, and when I do that, what I am doing is grasping the Dharma. Again, as like a trophy of some sort. Versus if I looked at the Dharma and this is what I try to do. If I looked at the Dharma, it would tell me to stop criticizing those other people. And so rather than grasping the Dharma, I should benefit from it in that way. So I, I think, again, no, or everybody, but I think that there's a very interesting through line to this sutta that it, it keeps coming back to one idea 
or you know a kind of a family of ideas and it's the grasping the teachings or grasping the dharma but all of that is wrapped up in this deeper teaching about no self in that way so but those are the through lines any other questions comments or ideas By the way, just in case you were wondering, um, at the beginning of the sutta, the monks, the other bhikkhus, and the Buddha himself, they mention, you know, that the that the Buddha has been pretty clear about sensual pleasures, right? In fact, he's taught a number of times with all of these different similes, the simile of the skeleton, the simile of the um all these the list of similes there is another sutta it's not in this collection though it's in the big uh samyutta nikaya the connected discourses that we were doing kind of uh, a few months ago there is a sutta where the buddha describes or i guess explains all of these similes um i should be a better dharma teacher and be able to tell you which one that is and i will so it's in majima nikaya fifty-four fifteen. that's where you'll find it or those and just for now though the all of them for example the one which is the butcher's knife or the butcher's block it's it's also the piece of meat one the analogy is a butcher that throws a dog a bone, but there's no meat on it. There's no marrow. There's no meat. There's just the bone. And it's about the dog getting basically nutrients out of it. And the analogy of the simile is that the dog keeps gnawing on the bone, but it's not actually giving him anything in that way. The The simile of the skeleton is the same way. It's about a bunch of vultures pecking at a skeleton and not getting anything. The simile of a grass torch is actually about carrying a flaming torch in front of you in into wind. <laughs> And the idea that the torch is just burning your face off. Um, all of these are simply analogies for the dangers of sensual pleasures. That ultimately we're searching for nutrients. We're searching for satisfaction out of sensual pleasures. And we are like a dog gnawing on a bone and not getting anything out of it. But we persist. Or we are like holding a flaming torch, but we're walking into the wind, getting burned by sensual pleasures, but we think we're having a good time. <laughs> or sensual pleasures are like a pit of fiery coal where we are going into it rather than trying to get out of it, which would be the reasonable thing to do. And then what I think is one of the more interesting ones is the analogy of the dream because it is where the buddha does use the analogy of all sensual pleasures being like sensual pleasures that you find in a dream they are temporary they are fleeting and they are ultimately not real in that way <clears throat> so that's the all of the kind of analogies in the beginning but this one focuses on the snake and grabbing the snake, like we, like we were talking about before. Um, yeah, then I suppose we can get to the Dharma of it, uh, like the juicy part, which is basically the, the section that begins the standpoints for views. That's where the Buddha starts breaking down the particular language about this is mine, or this I am, or this is myself. And the idea 
that we may have regarding the physical body. One aspect, of course, of the physical body is the actual rupa, as it's called, the actual physical form. But there's also the sensation body, like the actual like sensations you're having from the physical body. Then there's what you're perceiving through your senses of the physical body, right? And then there's your particular conditioning that comes from your perceiving those things sensed by the body. <laughs> and then there's what you're conscious of, which what you are conscious of is the result of that conditioning of the things you have perceived by the senses of the body. So those are the complex of the aggregates, which we would call a sentient being or a sentient self. But the idea is, of course, and we've done many sutras. This is not the first time we've heard this at all. But this is that language where a noble, a noble disciple, one who is trained in the Dharma, regarding the physical body, <clears throat> sensations, <clears throat> excuse me, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the noble disciple regarding those five aggregates does not think this is mine, this I am, or this is the self. Now, those are actually three different ideas. And there, it's very kind of interesting to explore each of them. And what I mean by that is, and I, I kind of talk about this a lot in Dharma doors, but I use the example of my hand. So that's a pretty normal, regular thing to think, right? That like, this is my hand. So regarding the physical form of the hand, there's one idea, which is that it is mine. It's not your hand, it's my hand. That's one relationship to the aggregates, is that the physical form of the hand, it's mine, but there's another way to think of it, which is that, no, no, it's me. It's not mine. It is me. Or regarding this, it's the idea that this is myself. And what I mean by that is, is that this cup, I do not think is mine, or I do think the cup is mine but I don't think it is myself. I think this is myself. Or it is me, or it is mine. But of course, what the Buddha teaches, what Buddhism teaches, is that a noble disciple regarding the body does not think it's mine, or that I am it, or that the self, like myself, is the body. And that goes true for sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Now, what we could talk about, which would be interesting, it's sort of about like, well, we, we wind up talking about this a lot, but it's sort of about, haha, <laughs> that's, it's funny. What I was about to say is, it's about the, the remainder. And what I mean by remainder is, it's the idea of like, okay, physical form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. If that's not self, and that's not self, and that's not self, and that's not self, and that's not self, what is the self? Like that's where you could logically get to. And that's what I mean by the remainder. 
it's sort of like, okay, well then where or what is the self if not the aggregates? And that's where we, in the Buddha Dharma, we go, no, no, there just isn't. It The Buddha calls it anatta, anatman. There just isn't that self. Now, there is a type of Buddhism that, in a way, doesn't, it, no form of Buddhism, by the way, wants you or wants identification with the aggregates. <laughs> it's just that some forms of Buddhism, and I would say like mainline, like normal Buddhism, and both Hinayana, Mahayana, but just like mainline normal Buddhism is ultimately no self like there's no self and it's definitely not in form sensation perception conditioning and consciousness but you won't find it anywhere at all there is sort of like one kind of branch of buddhism in a way that basically says nah the buddha just said that the aggregates weren't the self he didn't exactly say that there's no self at all, at all, at all, at all. <laughs> now, this gets tricky. And it gets tricky because, and I really, I'm not, I don't want to even want to spend too much time on it because it's not what this sutra is about. But I just want to draw our attention to the kind of um, the tricky nature of self. And what I mean by that is, is that it's very um, clingy, as we've talked about in the past. And what I mean by that is it's sort of like, and I, I know that I've mentioned this in the past, mind, not my mind, not your mind, but mind has a tendency to associate it's actually in a way how mind functions is associating and what i mean by that let me show you an interesting example yeah we, we have enough time for this so let's see So some of you have seen this one before, but I just want to show you like uh, uh, the way the, the mind works. It's kind of very interesting. So what it is, is it's like you take one ob object like this, right? So here's something. Here's something. And here's something. Well, skateboard, right? So boom easy it's easy count right i got three i've got three things here right okay well what i want you to think about is this there you go what's that and Right now, you might be thinking, well, it's a little skateboard stacked on top of a little cup stacked on top of a, of a clock. That's what that is. It's three things stacked on top of each other, right? Well, what if I told you it's my sculpture? Oh, look. All of a sudden, it's one thing. The one thing is my sculpture. And yeah, my sculpture is, you know, has aspects to it. But what I want you to notice is, is that now that I've given you the word, now that I've given you one word, which is sculpture, your mind is like, oh, oh, okay, I can relax and I can perceive it as one thing because you gave me a word for that one thing. But is there just one thing here? Or is the word kind of obscuring things and allowing you to associate 
these things together in ways that they were private previously, they were three separate entities. But I gave you language, I gave you a word, and it allowed for association. Well, what the Buddha is sort of basically talking about is eyeballs, ears, nose, tongue, body, all stacked together, and we have a name for it, either Michael or self or me or mine or I, but notice the word now allows for the associating of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body into one, one thing. And the one thing is me. But that right there, the self, the me, it's about as, as real as my sculpture, which is to say it has a certain provisional existence in language and differentiation, but is there really only one thing here? Is there really only one thing here? And that's where we could realize that it's the mind associating in the ways that it likes to associate things together in that way. So what the Buddha is describing or what I always think the Buddha is describing in here, it's that way the mind works of associating, clinging, labeling like that. And the problem with that is that then that mind that does that that way, when you try to convince that mind or explain to that mind, not, not self, sensations, conditioning, perception, consciousness, not self. The mind then wants to know what the self is then. But, but but that's its very nature in a way, to cling, identify, label, associate. And so it's just sort of habitually on overdrive doing that all the time. And so these contemplations, such as this, the contemplation that this physical form body is not mine. It's not me. And it's not self. And what I would like to encourage now is, or I would wa actually want to discourage, I would want to dissuade anybody from just believing this. Meaning just be, oh, Buddha said that the my physical body isn't self. So I have to convince myself I got to knock it into me that this is not self. This is not self. I would discourage anybody from practicing the Dharma that way. This is actually about contemplation. And it's why I always lead us through these exercises. And what I mean by that is if, if you lost a pinky, like it, it got chopped off, but then you got a pro a prosthetic new pinky right and it and it and it was a really fancy new prosthetic pinky right that it worked perfectly looked exactly the same right but your old pinky the one that like got lopped off you like kept it in the freezer right which one's yours and of course, notice that the mind can be like, well, they're all mine, <laughs> like all three of them, the one in the freezer, this one and this one. And it's like, OK, like notice you can do that, meaning you can claim ownership. But what I'm getting at is and what I've talked about is if you lose a finger or a hand, you don't think you die you just think you don't have a hand anymore. And what that shows is that you actually already deeply know that the hand 
is not mine. It's not the self and it's not what I am. You actually already know that. It's just that, it, you know, I, as I mentioned, okay, what if you lost both your hands? Would you cease to exist? You would not think that you cease to exist. What about both feet? What about both legs? What if you got a heart transplant, lung transplants, got a face makeover? You know, you keep going, you keep going. And of course, we can identify with those things. So it's not a mystery. But again, what I'm encouraging is from the sutra is looking at that way of thinking. Like actually looking at your own mind being like, huh, this is my hand. What does that mean? What does that mean for me to claim ownership over my hand? And again, thinking about, does it even make any sense? And if it does make sense to you that you have a hand or better yet, that you have a body or better yet, that you have a mind, if you have all those things, what is it that has all of them? <laughs> and that's where we could, again, investigate that. What actually do I think I am? Because at first blush, I think I'm the physical body. Like if you showed me a picture and it looked like this, I'd say, yep, that's me, <laughs> right? But again, the idea here is, is what, what thinks it's the body? The, does the body think it's the body? It's kind of what's happening in that way, is, but I digress. For time's sake, any last questions, comments, ideas? I know it was a big sutra, but again, I feel like it's a pretty straightforward one in that way. Not too many big, crazy words, like big, you know, Pali Sanskrit words. It's pretty straightforward on that. But... All right, then another successful sutra reading. Ah, the one last thing that I would love to encourage you to look at again and to think about, I wish I would have no, saw my note, I would have spent more time on it. All of this ends, and it's actually a great ending to what I was just saying with about the self and your possessing, possessing a body. It's at the very, pretty much the, almost the end, it's the section on the Arahat, and it's where the Buddha describes Someone who has actually achieved this understanding, this clear understanding about the no self idea, it describes that if the gods went trying to find such a person, that they could never find them because they are untraceable. I wish I would have saved a little bit more time to talk about this really, really subtle idea of being untraceable. It's just something to think about in terms of what we were just describing or what I was just talking about regarding, it's like, well, if I am not the body, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, if I'm not all of those things, what am I? And then you could continue to try to find like the real self. But if you actually have that, that stream entry kind of wake up moment of, oh, there is no self in that way. Notice how that would make you, you, untraceable. Meaning what, what would there be to point at to be like, oh, look, there goes Gnome. I couldn't point to the physical body. I couldn't point to the glasses or the hat or this or that. And now all of a sudden, that state of that non-attachment from self becomes untraceable. And that's a very interesting idea. So perhaps we'll, I'll find a sutra that 
gets into that for next week. But otherwise, everybody, I'm going to pause there for now. <laughs>